Welcome back to Principles of Engineering. Today we're talking about material testing. And uh, this module will prepare you to do the material test and stress strain calculations. So let's get started. Before we get rolling, be sure that you've downloaded and taken a look at the guided notes. Those guided notes will help you to structure your notes and help your retention with this material. When we talk about material testing, what we're really talking about is how we can evaluate material properties. And in this module, we're going to talk almost exclusively about tensile testing, uh, because that's mostly what we're going to do. Uh, but we produce a reproducible evaluation of material properties. And what that means is the results can be replicated and scaled to fit whatever size the material is ultimately used in. Now, we can break this down into two different types of categories. We can talk about static testing, which is how the material responds to a consistent and constant loading. And then we have a dynamic testing. Now, that is a varying loading. Now, we can look at things like cycle testing. Uh, we can uh, look at how it fatigues over time. But the bottom line is for dynamic testing, we vary the cycles. When we do static material testing, which is what we will do in this class, we're evaluating some of the material properties. Uh, four of the material properties that we can look at in static testing are strength, deformation, fracture. And then we can also look and say, well, does this material under static conditions meet our design requirements? So is it strong enough to hold the load that we're proposing? Some standardized tests for this are a tensile test where we put the material in tension. That's what we'll do in our lab. A compression test, where we put the material under compression. And then a hardness test. Now, there are other tests that we can do to evaluate a material, but these are a few of the tests that we'll talk about today, with our focus mostly on the tensile test. When we talk about a tensile test, it's really a uniaxial uh, test, meaning that the force is applied an axial force or lengthwise force uh, is applied in a straight line to the test sample along the y-axis. Now this test is destructive. We pull it apart until the sample fails. We look at the response to the force applied to the material to arrive at the characteristics of the material. An example, under what force adjusted for area does it yield? or break. So in this testing capacity, we use something called a dog bone. And that's basically just a standard sized piece of material. And what we do for a dog bone is we typically make a smaller neck region in it. And the reason for this smaller region, uh, where my cursor's flashing right now, is this allows us to this allows us to apply the force and predict that it will break in this narrowed region. So that's what we mean by a dog bone sample. Uh, it has a uniform cross section and that's kind of important because we're going to look at the force adjusted for the cross sectional area. So we need to make that uniform. Here's an example of a dog bone tester that your dog bone test sample that we're going to use in our class. Uh, it happens to be a small quarter 20 threaded piece with a neck or a body here, this shaft that's turned down to an eighth of an inch or about half the diameter. That means that the material will rupture in this neck region or this narrowed region right here. The dog bone is mounted in the tester and then it's pulled apart. Now, as we pull this apart, we're going to get a graph. And the graph is going to produce a force on the left-hand axis. And on the horizontal axis here, we're going to have a stretch. So in other words, we're looking at the tension force, F, applied until the material fails. As it's pulled, it stretches. So along the bottom axis down here, we're looking at how much did it stress stretch per unit of force. The force is displayed on the vertical axis. So we can create that plot. Now that plot is useful, but there's some problems with that plot. And the first problem comes in 
that if I take two samples, A and B, and B is clearly larger than A, in fact, it's three times the diameter, so it has nine times the cross-sectional area. If I apply the same force to A as I do to B, they won't respond the same way because sample A has fewer molecular bonds of material resisting the force. So if we test these to failure, will the force and the elongation be the same? Absolutely no. And it's because there's more material in sample B. So the elongation and then the response to the force is dependent upon how big the sample is. And it's dependent upon both how long the sample is as addition to the cross-sectional area of the sample. So both of those make a difference. The larger sample is going to have a larger load elongation graph. So how can we standardize this or manipulate the data to represent just the material and not the size of the material we test? And the way we do that is with the term stress. Stress just means that we look at the sample and we adjust the sample force applied for the cross-sectional area. So stress is the force per unit area. We arrive at the stress on a graph by dividing the load force by the original test sample cross-sectional area. That gives us stress. The units for stress thus will be a force similar to pounds or newtons divided by a unit of area. Inches squared is the common one that we'll see in our lab. So pounds per inch squared is a stress unit. So we can apply this in this example and we can say, hey, if I put 430 pounds of applied force on this sample, what is the stress it's undergoing? And we first have to find the area of the cross section. So the area is if I cut this body shape in half, it would be 0.125 diameter or 0.0625 radius. So the cross-sectional area of that circle formed in this body shape is pi r squared. My area is pi times 0 0.0625 squared or 0 0.0123 inches squared. So my stress or the force, 430 pounds, adjusted for the cross-sectional area, 0 0.0123 square inches, is approximately 35,000 pounds per square inch. Now, if I tested a larger sample, I would get that same stress characteristic, 35,000 PSI, because the force would go up, but so would the cross-sectional area for the larger sample. Well, elongation has the same problem also. And if we look at a rubber band and you take a rubber band and it's one inch long and you pull it taut so it doesn't stretch anymore, it may stretch another inch, inch and a half. Well, if I took a 10 inch rubber band, it may stretch another 10, 11, 12 inches. Does that mean the 10 inch rubber band is 10 times stretchier than the one inch rubber band? No. It just means that the longer rubber band, it, we expect it to stretch further because there's more material to stretch. So a longer sample needs to be adjusted the same way. So instead of measuring just raw elongation, we need to adjust it for its original length. And we call that adjustment strain. Strain is the amount of stretch per unit length or its elongation under load adjusted for the original length. We do that by calling strain epsilon equal to how much it stretched delta divided by the original length. Now you'll notice that if it stretches 0.1 inches and its original length was 10 inches, I'm gonna get a dimensionless strain term. What I'm really gonna get is 0.1 divided by 10 or 0.01 inches of stretch per inch of material 
original length. So we can do this calculation, and if we look at the, the dog bone with, that elongates 0 0.0625 inches, and its original length was one inch, this gives us a strain calculation of 0 0.0625, meaning that it will stretch 0 0.0625 inches for every inch of original material. So if I made the body of this component twice as long, I would expect the stretch to be twice as long also, but the strain to be unchanged. So when we adjust these two, I can now plot instead of force versus force versus elongation, I can now plot stress, force adjusted for cross-sectional area versus strain, stretch adjusted for original length. Much more meaningful results because what it's taken out is the size of the sample. Now we're just measuring the attributes of the sample itself regardless of its size. So when we start to stretch something out and we put it in tension, and this is a tensile test, you'll see this first part of the graph here is a straight line. It's linear. That linear portion right there is called the proportional region. So the stress and the strain are proportional, and the proportionality here is the slope of this graph. So it's stress, rise, divided by strain, run. We call this, where it's proportional, the elastic range. And what that means is when we release the force, the material snaps back to its original shape. So it's elastic. At the top of that elastic range is the proportional limit. That proportional limit is just the point where it stops being a straight line relationship between stress and strain. And you can see that on this curve as it moves up, it's no longer linear. The modulus of elasticity is what's defined by the ratio of stress divided by strain, or the slope of this line. So let's talk about units real quick. For a unit right here, for a unit right here, the stress was pounds per square inch. The strain was dimensionless, so our modulus of elasticity is given in pounds per square inch, or newtons per square centimeter, or newtons per meter squared. So that's the modulus of elasticity. Now what the modulus of elasticity represents here is that ratio, stress divided by strain, sigma over epsilon. Big E is the modulus of elasticity. Now the modulus of elasticity represents how stiff a material is, or its ability to resist stretching when loading. You can see that if this line becomes steeper and steeper, it carries more load per unit of strain it stretches less, whereas if the line is shallow out here, it stretches more easily. So a higher modulus elasticity represents a more stiff material, more resistant material to deformation. Now this is inherent in the property of any given material. And what it represents is it represents the strength of the material structure itself, how tightly the atoms are bound and what they're crystal lattice structure are, and a bunch of other terms, this is just summarized as the stiffness of the material. Now when you look at this graph, it's a little bit cartoonish, but if we are in 
this elastic region, when I remove the load, the test sample returns to its original length. So it's elastic or recoverable. Now the uppermost point of that elastic uh, line is the elastic limit. It's very close to the proportional limit, but the elastic limit is typically slightly above the proportional limit. So the proportional limit means it's a straight line. The elastic limit means it snaps back. All points in the proportional limit are within the elastic limit. So if we want a measure of how much energy this thing will absorb, when it stretches, we have to look at the area under the stress strain curve in that linear region. And it happens to form a triangle. This is called resilience. It's the amount of energy per unit volume that a material can absorb while it's in the elastic range. So it's the area of that triangle formed by the straight line. That is the resilience. Now, why do we care about resilience? We care about the resilience because sometimes we want something to absorb a lot of energy and then spring back. A car bumper is an example here. So we'd like that material to absorb the energy but not deform. Now the yield point is just past the elastic limit. When I go beyond the elastic limit, the material yields. And when we say yields, it just means that I start to deform it. And here, a slight increase in stress, a very slight increase in the force adjusted for the area, makes a larger stretching motion. Now, this is kind of cartoonish. Most of the materials we test are not gonna have that defined a yield point. But the yield point is where the material starts to stretch out physically and not return. Now, we usually talk about an offset yield point. We go about 0.2% beyond the yield point. And that's where it will produce a amount of permanent stretch. So we're sure it's going to stretch. That's what an offset yield point means. Now, we won't do a lot of those calculations. This is just if you see the term later on. Now, this entire area that is not part of the straight line is part of the zone that we call plastic deformation. And in plastic deformation, the material has bent. It's not going to snap back. So it's unrecoverable elongation. The material's not coming back. If I take the load off, only the elastic deformation recovers. It still stretches a little bit. Now the plastic deformation represents failure of the material. It may not have actually ruptured, but it's beginning to fail. And the part itself is now going to be outside of your tolerances. It has started to give way, and it's on its way to breaking. Now on its way to breaking, the first portion of this plastic deformation region, the test sample starts to elongate. It physically stretches. You'll see it stretch. So it stretches out. The cross-sectional area decreases. It gets smaller because the material is being stretched, kind of like taffy is pulled out and it gets narrower. But the load-bearing ability increases. So you'll notice it gets narrower, but it still takes more net force per unit area to stretch it out. Why does that happen? The reason that happens and the reason the material gets stronger is because it's being work hardened. So it's being hardened. The alignment of the crystals in the material are such that they are becoming more resistive to stretch. Even though it's narrower, it supports a greater load. So it hasn't failed. It's still in one piece, but it's definitely stretched out. 
And the process is the weakest point is stretched and becomes stronger. The new weakest point is just beyond that stronger point. It stretches and becomes stronger and so on and so forth. And it keeps happening until the decrease in the area is overcome by the increase in strength. Now what this looks like is necking. So you'll see right here on the picture, this narrowing of the body is necking. That's this peak strength right there. It starts necking at that. And the load bearing ability uh, peaks and then the force required to continue straining the test sample starts to fall off. I go down the curve to the right side here. Gets less and less and less. So it keeps stretching out and that thing necks out and it gets narrower. Ultimately, it necks and it snaps. And you can actually see the smaller portion of material at the neck where it fails. We call that fracture. Now, how much it stretched before it fractured represents the ductility or how stretchable is the material. We refer to that as the amount of plasticity before fracture. How far will it stretch before it breaks? The more it stretches, the more ductile the material is. If it doesn't stretch very much, we call that material brittle. So here's three metals, three materials, and you'll actually see these are the necking regions. Now this one stretched out quite a bit on the left hand side. Stretched out a lot before it broke. The middle one didn't stretch too much, and the far right hand one stretched almost nothing. So if I was going to look at the materials, I would say the far right hand is the most brittle. The second is between the most brittle, and the left hand is the most ductile. It stretched the most, you can tell from the necking. So brittleness looks like a very short and stubby graph. Brittleness is shown on the right hand graph. So this graph is brittle. And we can see because it ruptures very quickly into the strain graph. Whereas the left hand sample ruptured with quite a bit of strain or a lot of stretching per initial unit length. So we've talked about brittleness, we've talked about strength and yield and rupture. The last idea here that we're going to talk about in tensile testing is how tough is the material. And toughness is the ability to absorb total energy before you fail. So the bigger the area is under the graph, the tougher the material is. So this is represented by work per unit volume, the total area under the stress strain curve. Total area under the stress strain curve. So you can see pretty quickly that the toughest materials are ductile, they both stretch, and strong in terms of ultimate strength. So they have the biggest net area. It's the total area under the stress strain curve. Well, compression tests are done very similar to tension tests, except instead of pulling it apart, we push it together. Generally, your sample has to be fairly bulky. We'll look at some videos in class of uh, compressive tests, but I can't compressively test a tiny little rod because what happens is it starts to buckle. And it's just like your trusses in the truss tester. They all started to yield in compression because they were fairly narrow or they were what we would term as skinny trusses. So we use a fat sample here to resist bending and buckling. But what happens is as we smush the material down, and that's a technical term, or compress the material down, it flows, but it stretches out laterally. 
and it increases its cross-sectional area. So it's very similar to a tensile test, but it flows out laterally, the stretching is. Now it behaves differently. The ultimate strength in tension is not necessarily ultimate strength in compression of a material. Now another idea, if we start to push down on a material, is we can look at its resistance to deformation. So this is where we talk about ceramics and some other materials. They're very, very resistant to scratching and wear or cutting. So your phone out of Gorilla Glass is made out of Gorilla Glass because, principally because it has the ability to resist scratches. Secondarily, it's also fairly tough. Now we measure hardness with a few different tests, but I'm gonna talk about two different tests that we use here. The first one is a Brunel hardness. And a Brunel hardness, what we do is take a carbide ball and we press it down with a given weight, a known weight, for a known time. And then we measure the dent. The softer the material, the bigger the dent. So that's a Brunel hardness test. That's done for moderately hard materials. For very hard materials, we use a Rockwell test. And in this instance, instead of using a carbide ball, we use a diamond tipped cone and we force it into the material. We measure the depth of penetration. So these two tests, Rockwell and Brunel, are only good to relate to themselves. So a Brunel hardness compared to another Brunel hardness tells me which material is more resistant to deformation from pressure. Similarly, a Rockwell test compared to a Rockwell test tells me which material is more resistant to deformation. So this is a brief introduction into materials. Save your guided notes for future reference when we go to work on the problems. And next up, we'll go ahead and look at some stress-strain calculations where we use our input force, the area, and the amount of stretch to determine things like the modulus elasticity, the stress, and the strain. Thanks for watching.